Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Board of Managers, the President, uh, Randall Exxon, all the people who were responsible for doing this. It could not have been a greater surprise. Uh, and the company I keep in this, uh, I could not be more honored by either, particularly the last speech. Um, last, I guess two weeks ago, my daughter Catherine graduated from Haverford College, a, another local college you may have heard of. <laughs> And I, and I listened to uh, the speeches made by the people who were in this position and tried to think of what I would have to say to people who are uh, this much younger than I. Um, I first came to this college in 1968, 40 years ago, uh, which is to say twice your lifetimes, more or less. Uh, and much in the world has changed since then. Uh, I have changed a great deal and you will also change a great deal in an equal amount of time. Uh, for those who were not there and for those who were, let me just say that 68 was a pretty dramatic time. Uh, it was May 68 for me since I was in school in France during the famous upheavals there. It was the assassination of Martin Luther King and of Robert Kennedy. It was the Chicago Democratic Convention and much, much more. Those political upheavals created a context in which uh, entering into the arts was very complicated since it was not a, a question of becoming engaged by politics but of the world engaging you and having to kind of find a way to negotiate your own truce with real needs and real impending trouble and at the same time do things that were of individual interest to you. Uh, let me just do as a sidebar, Richie Schul and Fry and I arrived the same year. Uh, I owe him a great debt because I had been in France a student of so-called philosophy in high school a kind of glorified uh, title, and for some reason they sent me to the philosophy department. Richie uh, mercifully put me away from philosophy and handed me on another course. <laughs> uh, it was at this time that a lot of us were indeed protesting, complaining, and trying to put the world together in an image that more resembled what we thought the world was really like. Uh, President Bloom spoke of how in the early 1980s issues of diversity became, in a wide sense, academic policy in this country. But the beginnings of that were really at the end of the 60s and the early 70s, when the African American student group at this college and at many other colleges began to assert themselves, uh, when feminism began to be a force in thinking as well as in social policy, when gays and lesbians began to come out and began to speak for themselves. Uh, this was not, again, a matter of being politically correct, but rather of giving voice to things that had been unheard and unsaid. Now, art in this context, again, had a relatively lesser position than some of these other very imperative uh, kinds of things. And to truth be told, at this college, art had a very minimal presence altogether. The active work of Hedley Reese, who was mentioned, of Robert Walker, of Claire Kitao, and others in art history opened windows and doors, in particular for me, it was Hedley uh, who did so. Harriet Shore ran an exhibitions program here, which was very lively in the very small Wilcox Gallery. But by and large, the art programs here were a matter of elective, something that you did after, uh, you'll pardon the expression, the serious work of intellectual life, uh, as if somehow the arts weren't yet quite uh, one of the liberal arts. Uh, you can tell how much has changed. At that time, what I would do is I would go away for weekends to New York. Uh, and on one particular weekend, I went to a party in a loft in a then uh, underhabited uh, old industrial area known as Soho. <laughs> and in one evening met Jasper Johns, George Siegel, Christo, uh, Lee Krasner, who was the widow of Jackson Pollock, and saw for the first time the predatory behaviors of collectors, of dealers, and others. Uh, one might say this is how I got my apprenticeship, and it took me a good 40 or 25 years after that to apply it. Um, at that time, it was possible to think that there was one art world, and that if I had made this trajectory from Swarthmore, where there was very little, to New York, where there was this high density and actual easy access, I would have made it. But a summer uh, away from Swarthmore in Mexico, working for the mural painter David Alfaris de Queiros, uh, through friendships that I had gained here uh, from one of my classmates, Dennis Small, and through that to Betty, Cat Betty Catla, who was an Amer African American painter living in Mexico, I discovered that there were other art worlds and other art histories in the process of being made and also in the process or in need of being written. So I wandered, and the uh, version of my life that uh, President Bloom gave is actually somewhat uh, to the benefit, if you will, of an organized life. I have not had one, actually. When I graduated from college, I had no expectations. 
I had no career ambitions. The only role models at Swarthmore that I could look to, and some of them had not even serviced yet, were Bill Lieberman, curator at the Modern, and then later at the Met, Richard Martin, curator at the Met, and later at the Institute of Fashion Institute of Technology, and then Mary Schmidt Campbell of the Studio Museum. But I was 39 before I got my first regular job. Um, an artist friend of mine once said that the difference between artists and other people in other professions is that in another profession you go from A to Z in more or less calculated steps. What artists do is they go from A to B by way of E, Z, K, P, Q, and so on. Uh, we meander like snails. Now, <laughs> consider the reality that is facing you. The kinds of things that we fought for, argued for, and so on, an attention to a variety of worlds of art, an attention to a variety of cultural experiences, the fact that this art world is no longer centered in New York, nor even in Paris, nor in London, uh, that there is no cultural center, there are centers, it is polycentric and they overlap and touch each other in various ways. There is no mainstream that majestically moves from tradition downwards to the present. There are many, many, many types of art history and they flow together and the model is in this case more like a delta than a grand canal. That people now have greater mobility that they have, than they have ever had before and greater access than they have ever had before uh, comes, with, comes to you with a great deal of advantage. You are, if you're interested in the arts, either as a maker, a shower, or as a, an aficionado, somebody who likes to look. You are now uh, given a world which is far more uh, open and full and varied. But it comes with some downside, too. It, the art world now is more professional than I, professionalized than it was when I entered it. Um, at the time that I was appointed to the Museum of Modern Art's position as one of their senior curators, I had an MFA from an art college, no PhD, no MA in art history. Um, I have taught PhD students, but never succumbed until now, I guess, uh, to having one. Uh, and I have also uh, operated in a context where I was able to uh, simply learn on the job. Now increasingly, to do things in the arts as in any other discipline, you need to learn it prior to it and you need to be accredited. It makes it much more complicated. The sheer amount of information that people now have to cope with given this diversified world is something else to be reckoned with. Felix Gonzalez Torres, the great Cuban American artist who died of AIDS in 1996, said the problem is that we now have a surfeit of information and a deficit of meaning. Now one of the things that impedes meaning, of course, is the effects of money. And Cindy Lauper, another great philosopher, said money changes everything. <laughs> uh, there have always been rich collectors and it is naive to think that the art world was mostly made up of Van Gogh's suffering in garrets. There was always Rubin and Titian and Velazquez who never picked up a brush unless they were going to be paid and who liked to be, uh, hang out with kings and dukes and so on. The idea of the bohemian artist as this pure, out-of-society person is, is a myth. Uh, and great art has been made by some fairly disreputable people, it must be also be said. But we are now in a situation where there has never been more focus on celebrity and on cash than ever before in the American art world. And this makes it much, much harder if you add these things on, these distractions, the kind of People magazine, Entertainment Tonight version of the art world that you get through the newspapers and through the magazines. If you add this on to all of these other, much more legitimate kinds of diversifications and changes. Now the situation is, whereas for us it was a matter of taking what was said to be a simple world and articulating the ways in which it was actually much more complicated, now the problem is to take an incredibly complicated world and bring it into focus for each individual practitioner, art historian, writer, curator, and again, just member of the public. You have to make this enormously uh, polyfaceted, multifaceted thing proportionate to your needs, textured to your understanding of the world, and shapely in ways that make it uh, a new form for you, or misshapen in ways that make it communicative for others. Um, in a sense, I had it easy, you're going to have a much rougher time. Uh, on the other hand, I will tell you that if you uh, consider the uh, prospect of going from A to B by way of E, Z, P, and Q, you'll do very well, thank you, and good luck.